It's incredible! When he later did uh, Cruella de Vil, that was like <laughs> going the opposite direction from Maleficent. This is a really wild and woolly character that was all over the place, and I think it was kind of a relief to him to, to be able to do that character after the very stiff Maleficent. He said that uh, Cruella de Vil had other people to bounce off of. Anita, darling! How are you? Miserable, darling, as usual. Perfectly wretched. Whereas Maleficent, she just gave speeches. Oh, they're hopeless. A disgrace to the forces of evil. It's very difficult to do a character that speaks more or less directly to the audience and does not work closely with another character. So the one thing she had to work with was the raven. It was a story element for her to be able to talk to somebody. But I remember Mark sitting down there, and he had a, a, a little 16-millimeter uh, viewer, and he had gotten footage from the True Life Adventure people, and they had ravens that they had shot. Oh, I remember them borrowing film from us. I remember a number of times furnishing uh, animal footage to animators for reference. Ravens were in everything we ever made because they're such a ubiquitous bird. So Mark Davis' his impact on Sleeping Beauty is palpable. Milt Carl got the assignment of doing The Prince, which he absolutely dreaded. Mark and Milt both would love to have done fun things, but they always got stuck with all the realistic animation because they were the best draftsmen. The horse is a great example of what Milt Carl could really do. There was a sense of solidity and dimensionality, and yet, a very clean graphic look to the to the way the thing was drawn that made it he makes it look so easy no it cannot be uh, Willie Reitherman directed the sequence of the dragon fight <laughs> Willie well, was a very adventurous man and in art all the things that a person is at the soul of them, that seems to surface into their artwork. He was a fighter pilot in World War II, and so, you know, he'd seen a lot of action, and he loved action. Sometimes when you're uh, directing a sequence, logic might take a back seat to uh, emotion, and certainly in Sleeping Beauty and, and the Dragon Fight, well, he always talked about it. You didn't know how he, how he got through the the thorns or, where, or how his horse ever got up there. They used to criticize that thing when I showed it first. But Walt liked it, thank goodness. Uh, it didn't need the logic. You, you didn't have time to think. That thing was driving at you all the time. And that's what, what gives you the juices. That's what makes your adrenaline go. One of the most powerful climactic sequences ever in a Disney film. And I don't even know if it's ever been taught. It is just a tour de force of action. The film is just filled with gorgeous scenes done by the best people in the business. Great stuff that just really knocked us out when we saw it back in 1956. The animation, it was just, just fantastic. No one person ever creates an animated character. The voice has to be cast and recorded. And for a film like Sleeping Beauty that relies on so much realism, live action reference footage is shot, as well as the animation and the design. So it's a very complicated process. There's one thing that you can see Walt's hand, and that is in the casting. He was very meticulous about who he wanted to speak the lines. There are really good choice voices in this film. Aurora, she's not the innocent that Snow White was, nor even Cinderella. She has a dignity, even though she's just a princess, I suppose, but she comes off as a queen in the film. Well, and what are you three dears up to? Mary Costa is like the perfect fairy tale voice, very clean and Oh, she had to work on this almost mid-Atlantic, somewhat English accent because she comes from the South and she had to get the Southern accent out of there. Because this is a European fairy tale, but she managed beautifully, I thought. And Walt just loved her voice. Walt Disney called me and he said, you have a warm, warm voice 
and it expresses love from your heart. Also, your voice is so naturally placed that you can use your singing voice as an extension of speech. I wonder why each little bird has a someone. And he said, I want you to drop all of the colors and the things that you feel about Briar Rose to your vocal palette, and I want you to paint with your voice. I'm awfully sorry. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, it wasn't that. It's just that you're a... a... a stranger. And Prince Philip with Bill Shirley is uh, just as well a, a really good, solid voice. We all had a schoolgirl crush on Bill Shirley. He was so nice. He was handsome. He sang beautifully. And he was such a gentleman. He was a, a pop singer. I know you. I walked with you once upon a dream. She was really an operatic singer. And she proved it later by singing with the Metropolitan Opera. Very beautiful lady. Actually, I think Mark kind of used her as a model and Helene Stanley, both. Kind of a cross between the two for Briar Rose as the model. Helene Stanley was the gal who did the dance routines. She was a very pretty gal and she had ballet experience. Alice Davis, who had a degree in fashion design and had worked as a clothing designer, had designed and made the costume for Aurora. The costume they wanted when she was in the forest, they wanted it to be more like a dirndl skirt that the peasants would wear. And they wanted the skirt to fill out almost like a bell shape, but still twist around the body when she was dancing. So Mark drew what he wanted and how he wanted it to work. And then I made the costume and he was very pleased with it. So that was my first job working for Disney Studios. Live reference has often been used in most of the Disney films when it calls for a kind of realistic movement in which they shoot live actors enacting some of the scenes from a picture in which the animators can use as reference. Stefan, there's, there's something important I have to tell you. Uh, not now, Hubert. They would go in and rehearse the scenes with live actors. They'd set it up with props and boxes and then use that as reference. I was on the stage while we were shooting the live action, get my input into it and how I wanted to see them do something. I wanted it as broad as it could be and give me the most inspiration. I've seen some of them. It's very close. For example, the live action reference of the battle between the prince and the dragon. They have steps for him to climb up while he's swinging his sword so that you can really recreate that. Mark used to say, why make that stuff up when you can see it? Now, we have to remember, for animators today, we have a whole library of animation that we can go back and look at to analyze character and action. And you think, you know, how does someone fly? How does someone, you know, fight a dragon? We have all that. These animators didn't have that. They had to explore it and invent it themselves. They studied the motions of the characters on a frame-by-frame -frame basis before they went into their animation, and they pulled gestures or movements out of that. <gasps> Eleanor Audley, who did the voice work, did a lot of the live action. If you ever saw an actual still photo of Eleanor Audley, you can just think of Maleficent because that he drew very much from her personality to bring that to life in the film. I knew when the actors were coming in to record on the lot, and so we would all watch them parade in and say, that's her, that's, that's Eleanor, that's the one who's Maleficent. Look at her, she looks like what we're drawing. Oh! I think Eleanor Audley's voice is an enormously impressive voice. 
Eleanor Audley was a vocal artist who had a Disney past. She was the stepmother in Cinderella and just played it to the hill. Eleanor, for me, is the most interesting of the characters to watch in Sleeping Beauty, mainly because her voice is so powerful. Listen well, all of you. 